Welcome, everyone. We have Andrew Yan, Michael C., John D., myself, and Daniel B. Uh, we are aiming to talk about MAC address management, but we've uh, jumped briefly into vGPU support and pass through. So let's uh, at least summarize where we stand on that. And so, John, you were just saying that perhaps you've got experience with passing individual GPUs through the VMs and going from there and Sounds like, Daniel, you have a pressing challenge to get some amount of GPU resources and VMs. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, I have a number of systems where we, we pass the entire GPU through to the VM, and that seems to work quite well. Uh, and as he was mentioning, um, my clients are not typically using FreeBSD here. They're using one of the Linux variants, um, and they, they seem to like it. I will state that most of the environments where we're sharing the GPU, those are actually, uh, they tend to be VMware right now. Right, yeah, that this is, this is of course the, you know, my, my interest, my fleet could be, uh, is 95% is or maybe, maybe higher free BSD. And, you know, I still have, I think, Two VM uh, VMware uh, hosts that are that are stuck that way for exactly this reason. So, but I I mean, I'm close enough that I could throw in a couple GPUs and make it work. But if there's like a you know a proper VM server solution where I could do pass through on multiple devices in one one slot, that would be awesome. Um, um, I don't so. As far as I know, none of the features to split up bigger GPUs into multiple virtual devices you can hand out to different Beehive instances are supported on FreeBSD. So the best you can do is get single slot GPUs where, where the feature isn't um, blocked off in firmware or hardware. So the cheapest feature complete uh, quadro cards or something like that and hand one off to each uh, GPU accelerated guest. This is totally flexible and annoying, but that's as far as I know, all that's supported in FreeBSD right now. Well, by flexible, I mean, I could shut down a VM and then use it in a different VM though, right? Sure. Uh, once it's once passed through set. So it's not, it's not dreadful, and I mean, I, I think that that's that's workable for me. But certainly, you know, uh, and one of these other things might be more ideal. How many is do you need know, simultaneously? Probably, I mean, probably four is the you know the the max problem that I'm running into. You know, if I if ever want to sell RDP to... services or, or lease them, then that that could you know that could be it could start getting tight, but you know, I, I can, I can probably live with four. If you're to open to, uh, to YOLO setups, uh, you could use a bifurcating adapter to break out the four lane pairs of a 16 X slot into four slots on supported main boards to get. So that's why, yeah. So that's precisely why I'm surprised there isn't uh, such a, such a GPU you, you can slot in that'll, that'll do that. Oh, okay, there is. They just make it either locked down behind license fee or they are just I see. make um, it I really see. complicated like the NVIDIA one. NVIDIA one does support it, but there are so many configurations you have to do with their own utilities uh, in the host. Right. And yeah, it, it really requires the, host to be aware of what you're trying to do it, it, it's it is more complex yeah because uh, they, they, they kind of over engineer well they're not really over engineering but the way they subdivide it including how much memory you want to allocate to each vgpu and how much uh, jpeg encoder you want to allocate to each vgpu so it's not something that um Maybe they are internally using SRLV related stuff to handle that, but um, yeah, they, they're not really documented well, except that, oh, you use this uh, NVIDIA SMI command to create this uh, make instances. Oh, NVIDIA's documentation is atrocious. Yeah. 
I, I don't know which generation of NVIDIA GPU supports a vGPU. That might be an option. Uh, it's probably using SRLV, but it might be locked behind a license fee or something like that. So uh, maybe the driver itself requires yeah. a license fee or something. So I don't know. Mm. I believe the Kepler generation is the first that theoretically supported it. Um, but like I said, it's now old enough that at least on VMware, the drivers aren't up to date with current versions of VMware. So yeah, um, the immediately following generation still still supports it and works with current stuff. So you may recall Levi from some calls months ago, he and I have some proof of concepts with the cards I've mentioned there, the uh, AMD Fire Pros and the NVIDIA Tesla M10. And there are both official and unofficial ways to get those working under Proxmox with and without licensing. So we're gradually pushing that forward and hope to once stable, get it replicated in, in Beehive as a host, but somehow all that ma all the magical drivers work great on Windows and then fall down on both Linux and FreeBSD as clients. So it's been rough. I'll leave it at that. Um, Michael, if you've got some information about what AMD is doing in that sector, if you could put a link in the notes for it, please. Uh, will do. Since it's you mentioned it. Be fancier than that, but let's. Uh, it's a bunch of notes all over the place to consolidate, and that's a good motivator to do so. So thank you. Uh, AM. Because I've been having to dig into this in the, for the past two weeks on the VMware side, obviously. And uh, sure. yeah, I haven't found anything related to AMD doing anything in the sector at all. Oh, well, there's that. And it's a lot like open networking, where right before the pandemic, there were a whole bunch of steps forward in 2019 and an open graphics initiative. And then everything went silent. And hopefully people are crawling back out of those caves. But it's been very frustrating to say, hey, here's... You know, maybe I can find it. It's like AMD Open GPU Initiative. Have a nice day. And oh, and huge progress since then. Apparently, Intel with I believe it's Arc will not be locking things down as per tradition. Uh, so maybe that will be an answer because no one is happy with all the lockdowns on these. So uh, GPU. I'm sure Nvidia doesn't mind. <laughs> they love locking things down. Yeah. Well. well um... It's a monopoly. How do you raise margins? Unbundling and bundling and unbundling and bundling and market segmentation. And Intel's looking for anyone who will buy one of those things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll note on that. And we also talked about, like, say, just simply gua Apache guacamole to a VNC server, which at least kind of pretends like what we want. <laughs> um, I'll put this under AMD warm fuzzies because it's like, hey, here's that gpuopen.com, exciting new initiative, blah, blah, blah. And then, hello, why is the repo empty? Anyway. Uh, Thank you. Anything remaining on GPU and SRIOV? Or just quick question, is anyone using SRIOV for anything, networking or otherwise? Because at least the networking would be a great segue to I, Mac address management. I've tried to use it for networking, but found out that the old... Uh, Intel NIC in my lab machine had so far a few ring buffers that it didn't provide much of a acceleration because, uh, well, if you have, I think, eight ring buffers to allocate <laughs> per direction, then, yeah, with eight queues, you can't do much because uh, every I guest ends up single uh, queued per direction. Okay, so that said... Uh, I have OV in use, Michael. You have currently yes, or uh, as an, a lab experiment? It is in production use with both Beehive and QEMU. Okay, that said, uh, what NICs are you using that are proven? Um, I tend to use uh, either Mellanox or Intel. Okay. Can you name models if it's not too big a secret? Talking X710s um, hypothetically. I, I would love to give you. I'd have to go look them up. The were the Mellanox are mostly all 100 gig, um, and the Intels are 25. Okay. Uh, I might still have a couple. I710. 
Possibly. We'll go ahead and look those up when you have a chance. It need not be today, but that's a definitely a long-term question to address. Cool. There were some driver problems um, that I posted somewhere about uh, a long time ago for the the Intel driver that we have. Um, but I, I, I can we can talk about it later. Yeah, later. I've definitely seen X710 issues, and it's. Uh, either cosmetic or worse. <laughs> Some so of them have been really painful. Yeah. But there is a driver bug, in my opinion. Yeah. There is a <laughs> hardware design change between the 710 and its predecessors. Correct. And the new design relies on a faster on NIC CPU and lots of firmware, and the firmware has been ridiculously buggy in the beginning. I don't know if all the real world problems have been ironed out by now. I hope so. Uh, I've had to dumb down a few systems with uh, the X710 mezzanine cards because it's like, hey, they have a new quad port for a Dell R740. And it's like, great, hallelujah, let's do it. And then, nope, it's just nothing but trouble. Dumb it down to the previous generation out issues. Anyway, so... Mr. Bell, you are suffering from MAC address collisions. And I know Jan has some insights. He looked at the code of how, uh, without any other intervention, Beehive is generating MAC addresses. And so, Daniel, do you want to kind of first describe the issue? And then we explore what we think is happening and then what we think we can do to have a less painful experience. Yeah. So, um... Well, first of all, I should should mention that I don't know how often this is happening with with VM Beehive, which I don't know if it does a if it does a different, um, you know, if there's a if there's a different algorithm going on there. But between but between VMs, uh, jails, bridges, you know, and it doesn't matter which kind. So e, e pair, uh, IF bridge, net graph. Um, there is no net graph bridge interface, uh, Mac address. Um, but anyway, I am once in a while and I'd say it probably happens to me and I have a very, very small fleet, like, uh, 20, 25 servers, um, and a few hundred instances, um, you know, once in a while I'll spin up something and then it'll collide with, uh, I don't know, a bridge on an open sense box or, you know, another one of my hosts, uh, between you know, um, VM and uh, one of the other virtual uh, virtual devices. So we're not talking about uh, a, a ton. And uh, my my response to that is to you know create a randomized MAC address uh, like the uh, code that we saw from Antronig, um, Just a quick little one liner to to randomize. And then you know if I do that once there's a one in a million chance that I'm not gonna bump up with anything else. So um, then I just then I just hard code that into um, either the RC or the or the jail conf or the you know beehive uh, configuration and I'm, I'm usually good to go. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely happening way more than one would expect from 24 bits of entropy. Let's put it that way. Um, so, yeah, so somebody who know, knows the code, I'm sure, knows why this happens. And I recall it being based on like the VM name, which might be not a whole lot of entropy there. Uh, it depends on know, the head and letter rip. I don't think so. I in for well, at least not not for everything. I, I know that there's there are scripts that come with FreeBSD, um, uh, written by Devin Teske that uh, that um, that do use the name. Which might be pretty reliable. I haven't I haven't done that, and then applying that to VMs might might do okay. But there's still probably a better than chance, uh, you know, place where the the CRC and whatever method that we're using to derive the name into a Mac probably my, isn't I, random can I enough. Jump second, sure. Um, I'm looking at the man page, and I've actually run into this before. It, it says the MAC, if the MAC is not specified, the MAC address is derived from a fixed OUI and the remaining bytes from an MD5 hash of the slot and function numbers of the device and the device name. 
Yes. And most of the VMs that you run, if you're running any of the provided scripts, a lot of that information is going to be highly repetitive without, without a lot of randomization in there. And one of the problems with this algorithm is that if you run two guests with the same name and configuration on uh, different hosts, they will always collide. Oh, good to know. My fleet is derived from uh, CFS clones. So, uh, <laughs> so there, there's, there's part of the puzzle. So because... Uh, it's the guest name uh, slot and, and function and so on. So basically the PCI configuration, which virtual PCI slot it's in. And the MD5 hash is then truncated to 24 bits. And it always uses the same upper 24 bits by default. So semi-random, not, not that random. Yes. So yeah. this led me years ago to always uh, generate and specify my own MAC addresses. Yes. And I specify the address for the, for, for instance, for a tap device, I will specify it with MAC equals. Um, and on the local side for the tap on the local hypervisor, I modify, I typically modify the MAC there to be the same MAC with a couple of bits ORed in. Uh, everything I do has the UL bit set the two bit in the high eight bit. Um, and since doing that, the pro my problems have basically disappeared. Exactly. Um, we could talk about SRIOV or something like that again, because this leads to problems where I, if you, ha if I have to regenerate a, a, a Mac on a local PF device that gets or FDF device, it gets interesting. But that's that's not the point of this discussion. And a I feel like it's a some list of MAC addresses from shredded old network uh, equipment of a former employer. <laughs> and just that's one some way to do that. it. Basically, we had these just when decommissioning something from for good. For a while, they collected the MAC address from the inventory system, and he just dumped it all into a text file. <laughs> these network car cards will never show up again because I've seen them go through the shredder. But uh, that's yeah. not a universal uh, solution. Unless they're a low-end feel... NIC where the vendor put the same MAC address on all devices. No, no, <laughs> really been a he worked for an ISP. So or not nothing finally, <laughs> I've seen that. You've seen that. Oh, God. Okay. It's more like yeah, Cisco if, line cards. The... You can you can buy a short Mac, I think, uh, you can, uh, and a short o -E OUI, which I think is, I, f I forget, it's more than 24 bits, obviously, but, um, you know, I think you can buy them for like 700 bucks. <laughs> so that's one way to solve it. But I do think that at some point with a fleet large enough, I am going to have to eventually manage, you know, manage them centrally, whether it's, whether it's randomly generated or not. Or, really. or not. Because uh, there's a single bit in a 48-bit uh, MAC address to indicate if it's a globally allocated one or a locally allocated one. And you can, so you have 47 significant locally allocatable bits and you can just partition them and have like the upper all but 16 bits allocated to a host and then you have 16 bits locally for the host to allocate from. So instead of allocating each unique uh, address or split it with slash 24 and uh, call it a day. <laughs> so you could uh, just do the same thing it does right now, but uh, have each host use its own prefix. Uh, I've managed to recreate the default algorithm in shell scripts. So that I can. I like uh, that, except for the fact that I, you know, uh, the. Well, I mean, I guess the it's wherever wherever it was generated, because obviously the, uh, you know, for for, uh, you know, for redundancy and during patches, I move VMs. Uh, oh. VMs tend to migrate a lot. Um, Okay, in that case, you want the MAC address to go with a virtual machine instead of belong to the host. 
Right. So, but, but there's still like, you know, I could do, uh, you know, cl- so, so there's like a client identifier or something. I could use some, some bits to specify, you know, some, um, you know, so, some list. I, anyway, I, it's the same, same sort of challenge in building IPv6 addresses and stuff like that. So uh, I can, I can come up with something, but but I am going to have to do a better job of keeping track of them since this does seem to be happening more and more to me as time goes on. Um, so yeah, I think I think implementing something like this centrally is a is a good plan for 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 sure. Uh, is there a go to solution daemon package for just traditional organizations without any virtualization to ma- manage MAC addresses that get fed into, say, various generations of DHCP D servers? I mean, I don't know. What's in fashion? What do the Ansible folks do for saying, hey, all MACs are handled over here? We do it this way. Yeah, I was going to have good. to home grow something with salt. Um, but that's a good question. I mean, this it can't is be the first person having this problem. issue rephrased. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this, the, somebody solved this problem in a, in a more general way. You're right. The Ansible people, obviously, you know, people dealing with hundreds and thousands of devices obviously have a solution for exactly this. Um. The if you're simplest solution is if you have. With it, I'm Sorry. happy to provide a, a very short snippet of code here that that to sh- to show how I typically deal with it. That's you, John, typing in chat. It looks like. Uh, no, that is not me. Oh, that's Jan. Sorry. Uh, okay, so Jan, you've got yours. Let's both let's hear it from both of you. It's all good. It's awesome. Um, no, this is the code in Beehive. Which that's does the Beehive. A okay. Hash calculation. Thank you. Uh, it's. Uh, PCI function, uh, slot PCI function, uh, host name, joined by dashes, and then the MD5 hash, and take the lower three bytes. And the upper three bytes are a fixed prefix by default. So, John, you have an alternative approach? Uh, I just, so I allow my users to generate their own Macs based on a couple of different um, ideas, but I don't have edit. Can I can I send this snippet to you somehow, Michael? Uh, the, the document's wide open. If you put it at the bottom there, uh, I'll just format it as appropriate. So just I, plop it let, in. And it should be editable to the whole world. No, that's been amazingly yeah, knock on wood. Working, Fun. But let me, try, let me try again. Okay. Things never work for me the first time. I, I learned that one years ago. Um, uh, there's the Jan, code. is that in beehive.c or where is that handled? Or uh, it's in uh, net underscore utils.c inside the beehive directory in FreeBSD 13 at least. Okay, uh, could you paste that in chat net slash something.c? I missed, couldn't hear you. Or straight in the dock, whatever works. Ah, thank you, net utils. Thank you. Okay, right. anonymous turtle, go for it. Thank you, Google. <clears throat> if this will work. Ouch. Okay, that didn't look so great. Oh, I can um, fix that. I can fix that. Just one sec. Okay, um, go for it. The, the secret is uh, on Mac command backslash, which deformats, and that, then something that, like uh, fixed width. Yeah, it needs yeah, that, a definite fixed width. I tried to get rid of all the, the uh, tabs out of it before I sent it. Oh, yeah, well, there's that. Um, Understood. Uh, yeah. You may format it however you want, but I hope this gets the idea across of what I try to allow them to do. And um, then I why just, did uh, you fix it to six? Just because. So in the random case, 
where you let, let them generate five bytes of entropy plus so, oh, zero six is a the prefix i use for all of our locally generated stuff either o, o2 or o6 that okay. has the uh the ul bit set mm -hmm. this is the mac the mac address that goes into the vm for this device but it has more um, than oh let him finish let him finish and um, then on the outside of the device on the tap of the on the tap on the hypervisor I then set the MAC address to be that MAC uh, with typically with a Fox Easy, uh, so that we can map back and me people can easily map back and forth between oh. which network device uh, holds their particular uh, v, uh, tap on the inter inside of Beehive, which allows them to do uh, their network uh, t uh, DCP dumping or or whatever it is okay, that they want. So the you provision the Tap interface with the uh, four bit uh, so with the four bit toggled off. So with the O four uh, O two prefix, which is still local. Yeah, any any value in the top eight bits that has the O two bit set is a UL. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, Mac. It's locally administrated, so there's a there's a whole there's a whole set a whole range of them that we can use, and I selected a couple of them and documented them to the users, so that it's very easy for them to go in on their on their VM and also go on to the hypervisor and be able to, for instance, locate which uh, which device they are they are using and to be able mm -hmm. to TCP dump things if they need to. Um. What works with Ansible is that Ansible has um, filters for doing math on IP addresses, generating MAC addresses, and so on. Mm -hmm. Under a, and you can specify a variable length prefix in either case. Uh, you can even do math telling it to get me the next uh, IP address within the subnet and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Which is quite nice. Uh, it's, I think the latter part used to be only a community module for a long time, but now I think for it's in the default. The other thing is that um, what works really well for me is if you have some kind of writable source of truth. I wouldn't recommend using LDAP like I did because I just had an LDAP service available, and so I use that. But anything at Nomad and console or etcd or whatever is writable and your source of truth works to have it register its address as long as you have the option to claim something it could even go into your uh, ipam solution if you have one So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to answer your question. And I think the best way that I can do that is to simply say that for the networks, for the subnets that I am responsible for, I am the source of truth. Um, and if I have a problem on those subnets, I am the one who has to uh, yes. determine, determine and figure out what the problem is and fix it but if you get to start from a, uh, in a greenfield you could deploy something like netbox and have it register there tell us and, more about netbox briefly uh is there a link yeah of course it's part of the fritz box no not at all <laughs> it's an <laughs> ipam uh, open source self-hosted software to keep track of your IP addresses, VLANs. Mm, that's backspace, somewhat the question like I had that. a second ago. Okay, so there is such a thing. Let's take a quick peek together. Oh, Premier. Well, there you go. That's a source of truth. This could be a religion all its own. Um, hmm? so <laughs> by combining that, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, and are you using this or you've only discovered I've this? I've tried it, it works, but it was overkill for my use. Cool, well, noted, thank you. We wrote one in. Um... Or at least it used to when I tried it. 
my my team actually wrote one in in uh, in Notion and uses a- APIs to go back and forth, which is just so slow and painful sometimes for requests uh, that uh, I probably need an intermediary. So something like this might do well for me. One of the common complaints of netbox is slow is to, that people uh, forgot uh, to uh, do the optional Redis uh, configuration. And then it does all the caching and locking in uh, Postgres instead of an in-memory database. And Perfect. that will create a lot of some kind of rights. Not bad. Network to that. slow uh, do the not, not absolutely mandatory part of the uh, getting started guide as well, or installation guide. Interesting. It seems like something I need as well. At your scale, it's probably very useful. Just had a can you do things of... like generating IP address as well? Yes, it does that. You can even just de- uh, have, a, uh, you can't just have a generate IP addresses, but derive subnets. So you can allocate, uh, so basically put your address plan in there if it's not too complex and t- tell it, yeah, I want need a new slash 26 on this side uh, and you will get the next one, which is available. Interesting. And then you give it a name. You can document a lot of stuff. So uh, the Freifunk community uses this to keep track of all the spo- the sponsored resources they have access to. <laughs> like someone sponsored a virtual machine here. Someone else offered a dedicated service here. We can co-locate something here. Stuff like this. So hypothetically, how would a Beehive VM query this repo? If it's uh, not the pristine. Beehive VM would query it. Or the host with the, the VM. host. Yeah, the tool you. generating the host configuration would uh, allocate it and then write it out. You can have a, a report language as well. So you could have it, you could write your own uh, report in Yammer, uh, sorry, in Ginger. And then okay. the report would be the relevant configuration snippet. Well, so from the host management perspective, uh, wh- how do you knock on the door of Netbox and get, say, the appropriate Mac for the given VM name? Uh, REST API? Yes, REST API. I see that mentioned, OK. And this uh, probably would be run, managed from my orchestration uh, system, like Ansible not already host. have modules. Uh, a lookup modules to look up information in there. Okay, cool. So that you can just have Ansible look it up and then use it as a fact in, in your Ansible template or something. And all of this would be configuration time, not startup time, unless sure. you're doing very <laughs> dynamic things. Well, thank you for that. I had not heard of it. And very cool. Uh, Daniel, having kicked this off, does this leave you with a path forward or multiple paths forward? Yeah, I think uh, maybe too many, but ah, well, I can have a I can have another meeting with my team just about this and, and decide how to move. But uh, but yeah, this uh, yeah um, yeah, John, your code will definitely come in handy. I'm gonna. Uh, steal pieces of that for sure. And John, we're free to use that. Uh, you're looking at my personal code, not business code. So okay. yes, it's not a GPL or something. <laughs> no. even, I, I, I'll that even use raise? it for inspiration for sure. If I could, I'll repeat a couple words I heard earlier. In my environment, the MAC address follows the host. So once typically, typically once I generate a MAC address for a host it stays with that host. I do not generate a new Mac every time I bring the system up. No. VM or host or what? Uh, VM. Okay, okay. 
when I'm working with the network team and with their tracing MAC addresses, um, if we bring something up and down and it changes, that just makes the, the process really hard. So <laughs> users will hurt you. I'm sorry? If you do that, you will, your users will come find you and hurt you if yes. the IPv6 address changes every time they reboot. Yes. And I wouldn't even blame them much. <laughs> so that said, uh, the, or the MAC address follows the VM if you're following along here. I just want to construe that correctly. Um, any other the, best practices? One of the things to look out for is make sure your clever MAC address allocation policy doesn't create an ungodly amount of uh, hash collisions in the um, IPv6 multicast group membership for NDP and so on. So if you pick your algorithm in such a way that all of your sequentially allocated addresses end up in the same NDP uh, group, um, you get a lot of unhappy networking teams hunting you down. I think that's a little bit over my head. Uh, can you- uh... Just auto increment, don't get try to avoid auto incrementation. Oh, got it, okay. Someone uh, in a long uh, mailing list thread I discovered somewhere archived was that he, tried, he by accident did the same thing IPv6 did. And then what happened was all the devices allocated this way were hashed to the same hash when it came to joining IPv6 multicast groups for neighbor discovery. So basically all of the scaling advantages IPv6 has, which makes it possible to have large uh, layer two networks without lots of broadcast traffic were effectively disabled. And the right. other problem so was that he created a excessive amount of MAC addresses and uh, overloaded the poor top of rack switches because it's he a had little more random with tens of thousands helpful. of MAC addresses. Right. So a little more randomness is helpful in, in these Yes, random situations. is fine. Yeah. Just... Randomness is probably one of the best things you can do in this case. Or and, and the next best thing is just start somewhere and go sequentially. Michael C., any observations or comments? Uh, no, I just realized, like, yeah, I think yeah, I don't think I have anything particular. Well, this topic was probably a few years overdue for getting some attention. So thank you, everyone. Uh, one of the things to watch out coming. for, uh, if you actually buy into such a IPAM solution, it becomes load bearing during debugging. You buy into so what solution? Jan? If you buy into a netbox or any similar product, it yeah. will become load bearing during debugging your network. So you will have to look up the, if you allocate a lot of stuff dynamically and the only place you keep it is in this database and not inside some spreadsheet somewhere, you suddenly need access to this to uh, troubleshoot your network. So it's not just a nice to have feature for configuration and creating new virtual machines, but also for network troubleshooting. So, because otherwise you will get lost in the, if you make use of all of the features and have it pick the next three network because there will be no more structure than the one you configured instead of the things operators normally do if they keep track of such things in text files or spreadsheets. And a colleague mentioned this for what it's worth. PHP IPAM for address management. Anyway, uh, now we can branch out into related and orthogonal topics.
I have one. Sure. One. Um, and this seems to be a, a rolling hot topic every few years. Um, it would be really nice if Beehive supported writing its PID file. Um, okay. Uh, tell me what you've seen that led you to that conclusion. Well, it's just another area where, um, I mean, you can Google this and basically there are literally, you know, dozens of, of solutions to writing a PID file and, oh. mm -hmm. you know, people that, that write their own stuff. I mean, run Beehive, put it in the background and get the PID of the last backgrounded process and write a PID file. I mean, we can do this stuff, but it's everyone it's, out there basically uh... they're reinventing the wheel. And it would be nice if we just put the wheel on Beehive and we're done with it. Are we talking proper I, service management? Or are we talking no. the bare minimum to get us going? <laughs> um, <laughs> because... uh, go ahead, John, then, then Jan. Because Jan will gladly I, tell us about S6. But go ahead, John. Not really. Not okay, just, cool. <laughs> not sure. I would simply like a straightforward process to get the PID file so, without having to use, you know, grep or any number of other mechanisms that have been used in the past um to 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 get the pid file and then issue the appropriate kill signal to the process to get what we want yeah peep kill beehives your friend just let her rip hope for the best um, i don't know <laughs> go ahead <Jan. laughs> so if you know that you're targeting a beehive process because beehive uses the guest name in its name at runtime you uh with a proper usage so make sure to exclude all jails or have one jail per beehive and then you can use uh, pgrad uh, dash x or pkill dash x uh, to I'm, match exact I name agree. if you know the guest you want to kill and be sure that you will only hit this process unless root uh, wanted to mess with you okay that's not elegant but reliable and easy to use you can also use the daemon tool already available in base to demonize uh, it. It can also write a PID file for it and for process it's supervising. I, so I actually already use the daemon process to demonize a script that actually runs Beehive so that I can do the appropriate types of cleanup or reloops depending upon yes. um, uh, why Beehive came down. But once again, these are all these these are all um, many ways of solving the same problem. And if, if Beehive had a PID file, it would make a lot of them easier. No, it wouldn't yeah, really I because... Hold on. Uh, Michael, see what you got. I can comment a little bit. The reason why uh, this is not really work is because there's multiple way to bootstrap um, a Beehive virtual machine, but not necessarily tied to the Beehive process because you can use uh, Grub Beehive or others to basically load the kernel first before you involve Beehive to actually run the process. So because of these architectural things, uh, you kind of have to break into multiple stages to do the same thing. Instead of say, I can just have one okay. process and if I kill the process, you just kill the virtual machines uh, because that just doesn't really work too well. Um, because not everyone is using UEFI to run their beehive, and that's the main problem. Um, in theory, there's also the bad old CSM code, but yep. But so not, even that is better than using uh, beehive load or grab beehive. So I agree with the statement that was just made. However, I, I've always viewed the load as different if you killing or getting rid of the beehive process is different than issuing a destroy on the on the vmm related resources mm -hmm. i, oh, I don't yeah, know how other right. feels about feel about that but that's how i've always tried to 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 look at this set of issues and make sure that i never leave anything any resources hanging around um the problem is that Right now, Beehive uses its exit status to signal 
information to its parent process. Correct. Or its Weeper. Yes, it does. And that makes sense because logically there is no guest at that point anymore. It's the last will and testament of your poor little uh, virtual machine to either be halted, destroyed, uh, or rebooted, or shut down uh, with a power off. Uh, or it has crashed with an error. You're triple faulted or whatever. And you need some kind of parent process to implement the policy. This isn't a mechanism question, but a policy question. And the policy shouldn't be baked into Beehive. What's missing is some agreed upon tool to hook in and implement your policy, for example, to just re allow guests to reboot themselves. So then so Beehive, control, down. Beehive Control needs to issue the, the signal to allow the soft off to occur. No. Well, that, that's, that's, oh, an, that's that our a very long time communication API. Ambiguous. So, I'm sorry? Well, it's been ambiguous on, you know, sending an ACPI shutdown. You, it, you had to always look up the PID. You couldn't do it by VM name. It'd be great if Beehive Control could do that. Continue. Um, you don't have to look up the PID. You can use pkill uh, and have it look up the PID and match against the process name as long as you don't assume that anything else runs as root and will... Um, the name itself, beehive colon guest name. Uh, feel free to drop in that syntax, given that it's come up a few times now, but uh, okay. that's a bit orthogonal to what John was saying about it. I don't care how beehive control identifies the VM. We already use beehive control and the dash VM, dash dash VM equals option is the same across them. So to me, that is the predefined API that someone came up with long before we got here. So if I can use Beehive Control dash dash VM equals name soft off, I'm I'm good. That that solves my problem. Agreed I don't, completely. I'm not argue, I won't argue the point. Yeah. Well, would that preclude the need for the PID file management? Uh, in general, I think it would. There's already a destroy on uh, option uh, yeah. on Beehive Control. Does that sound familiar to everybody? Hmm. Yep. Yes, but it's uh, the nuclear option. It doesn't right. give the guest a chance to perform a clean ACPI shutdown if you destroy right. it. Without question. So let, so let we add it to Beehive Control. That seems, that seems to follow the current architecture. I don't really expect us to solve the problem here. I just, whenever I Google this every every couple of years, the the same it's the same rolling type of subject. So I'm curious in the code, what is Beehive Control doing to map from name to PID? Uh, I am not uh, sure. That Beehive does. Control doesn't. It doesn't. So that's it uh, uses the VMM right. device. Oh, it's purely device based. Okay. Uh, uh, map from the name. Okay. And it the same doesn't. black rock for P kill as well. What this does is it makes sure that the process runs with user ID zero, so root, that it's not jailed relative to where you execute um, P grab or P kill so that you don't shoot into jails if you have nested jokes or if you're on the word. And the other part F um, 
matches against the full argument vector and not just with a uh, process name. So beehive colon and then the journey and the X requires a perfect match. So and yeah, the arguments are concatenated with a space. So it just. Uh, thank you for that syntax, Jan. That might be in my book for me a few years overdue. <laughs> So, uh, and you added read guest. What do you mean by that? Oh, here we go. Ah, yes. Yeah. And yep. the meaning of sending as the signal changes whether the guest has already uh, enabled ACPI. So before ACPI, it's basically um, just kill the Beehive process. And after the guest uh, kernel has uh, enabled ACPI su support, which they all do before they mount any file systems. Uh, so there's no risk there. You uh, get a, a soft shutdown. Yep. In any way, is this a state machine question or is that purely no, the, the jail is... call overlapping into this? Hmm? Is it's that purely the jail call overlapping into this? Uh, no, no, the jailer was just the, uh, the guest I used for testing the syntax because I had to yeah. cobble it together. Uh, related... I've heard the complaint re relatively recently that if you are the new person at the company and you have 20 running VMs, it's very difficult to um, determine how we got to any given VM and what its resources are and what its configuration is. Um, it follows the theme of just documenting the running state, be it a PID or otherwise. Um, have um, you, John and company, found any useful uh, tips and tricks for determining how a VM came into existence once running and you have nothing, no knowledge of its origin? So that's a multi-part question. Um, it is. <laughs> so I, I will give you what I think is the most relevant part to your answer first. I have a local patch, which I add a dash D option to Beehive, which enables the dump command. Are you familiar with that? In the config in the Beehive config file, you can enable a options dump. Yes, and you yes. can uh, just uh, insert this option from the command line to run Beehive with the config file, and then uh, append the dump flag, and will change the meaning to dump the configuration out. Yeah. So I keep. So what happens is, I have a copy of the exact uh, options used to. In the, in the environment above uh, Beehive, in the, in, the, in the management tooling, um, I support a, a comment mechanism where the folks who can enter a, a comment or information about the system, like why, you know, what it's doing. Yeah. Um, I've always kind of wished that Beehive had a, um, a, a comment option or a description option or just a an option that eats its arguments. Um, uh, unused so I, arguments in the config uh, format are ignored. Yeah, you can have your own arbitrary ones for what You can what. just use it, call it comment as an option in the config file and it gets ignored. I haven't actually tried that. Yeah, it's kind of, um, that's a step forward. And I, I think everything... The config format oh, also just so has a that. comment character. I don't remember if it's hash or semicolon. Um, so you can put real com syntactic comments in there instead of hijacking a well-known unused uh, key. You know, I probably should have known that because I also have a uh, I also have a patch that implements more of the SM bias keys, um, which the oh. original parser ignores. Um, and then I had a cohort who wrote the code to uh, parse all of those out and then generate the uh, generate the appropriate code to insert them. When you say patch, do you mean a seat-based patch to Beehive itself or just an if Yes, I have, I have a patch to Beehive. Uh, do you think that's worth upstreaming? Um, I've actually, 
I've, I've actually tickled that a couple times and I've basically gotten no response. So I just, I let, let it be. I'm, I'll, I'll have, I'm happy to, I'll drop the patch on my, uh, free BSD ID and, and send you a link to it. If you want to Please poke do. at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, We're all in this together. Um, anything behind a uh, hash in the config format is ignored. So you already have support for comments in Beehive config. So, yeah, so I think I understand what you're saying. I don't actually use the config file to run Beehive. I typically build, I have an options command line and part of that is historical. Mm -hmm. um, but I've, I do have Beehive output a config file for what you were asking about earlier, Michael, which is a, a, a tracking of of how and what re what resources are, resources are in use by any given VM. One of the things I don't like is that Beehive actually resets its uh, com its command line. Um, I I actually have a patch to disable that too. What do you mean by reset the command line? So if you do a PS, so when you do a PS, you don't actually see the command line used to execute Beehive. Or uh, yes, okay, right. Um, and I have a, I, somewhere I have a patch where I used to undo that, um, because I like, I used to, one of the things I used to do before setting the Mac address on the internal and external sides of the pipe, um, I would use a PS and go look for the Mac address assigned to that interface. Um, sorry, I, I have, apologies if it seems like I'm going in circles here. I've, I've gone through many, many gyrations of how this works over the years. Hey, it's all good. We, and as have we all. So let's uh, gyrate a few last times and then come up with some sanity. Um, and you say you have a patch to simply spit out the and PS the full command because that would be I, I'm constantly debugging storage systems with PS. AXWWWW just to see everything possible to a replication uh, command, just yeah, the works. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I do. I, I feel for you. I, <laughs> I have systems. They're facts. They're important facts. Go ahead. Yeah, they are. I, I do what most many people do if this helps. One of the things that, that, I, that I do production for work is I run large scale NFS iSCSI type servers and I run them as VMs. And I use a uh, device path through PPT to, you know, pass through the uh, Broadcom uh, HBA network cards, like the Mellanox 100 gig cards. I will just pass that entire device through to the VM. Uh, part of the reason for doing this is if we have to take that storage device down and reboot it, the, the, the cycle time is is measured in seconds instead of half an hour. Yep. If, if any of you are familiar with some of these large scale storage devices, it's it's just absolutely painful. The faster the computer, the slower the boot. <laughs> oh yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Man, you know, I, I I grew up on a 360. If anybody remembers those, and they used uh, to boot faster than some of our systems today. How many days did it take for the initial program load? <laughs> Well, it depends on what you called the load, the initial program load, IPL. Uh, oh, those were the days. Oh, boy. Anybody uh, who tells me they wrote their own three-card loader, that I know what they're talking about. Um, do the, doesn't IBM still emulate um, a tape drive? And by that, I mean a punch tape drive to boot? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I will never admit to anybody that I know JCL or Jez. <laughs> uh, I sometimes listen to someone reporting from his trauma, supporting an application. The source code was lost uh, 10 years before he started in the company. Yes, I, I understand. So it's written in 31-bit uh, assembly and uh, maintained with, and he had to add um, JSON output to it. 
Uh, so that that's newer code if that's 31 bit addressing. <laughs> that's prior Wait. to the say above the line stuff. Anyway, sorry, that's history. No problem. So just taking this to the next step, assuming all this is in place and things are wonderful. Jan, we've with your pioneering work, you've got say hot pluggable CTL based vert IO SCSI uh, storage sure. backs ends, back ends. That said, do you think we uh, lose or we would lose transparency to a VM's current state and configuration if things become more hot pluggable, pluggable or do we have to query then a CTL list or elsewhere? Um, can you rephrase your question in a more precise manner because- I know. Uh, so if a VM were to have hot pluggable CTL storage and it's have changed several drives over the course of several weeks and the new administrator sits down, will they have a short path to seeing the current state of that storage or would they likely only see what it was like initially when the system booted, the VM booted? Depending, basically they can only see the configuration files on the host and the current state. Those can be out of sync and depending on what you're doing, that can be intentional. Got it. Um, I'm, for I'm example, planning you for life in the promised land here. Go ahead. Hmm? <laughs> I'm planning for life in the promised land here. Continue. Retirement? Uh, yeah, that. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, just joking. Um, so the, the thing is, I have only glued all of this together using Ansible uh, and then executed all under S6RC supervision and management, and it works. In 13.2, I'm no longer getting the warning, so whatever Marv did works, even in 13.2. So I'm, I may sound a little negative towards FreeBSD here, and I apologize. Um, it would be really nice if FreeBSD were su to support the the mechanisms available in QEMU, where I can go in and dump the device tree and and all of that other nice stuff. Well, if anyone not negative uh, used it, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, the whole uh, libvirt XML crap. No, I'm not talking about libvirt. I'm referring to you can like run the HMP command against the QEMU and uh, have it dump its device tree and all kinds of stuff. Mm, hey, the what's is... the command HMP and HMT? Um, I, you'll, if you'll wait a minute, I can. Yeah, give please you drop an... in, drop it into Docker chat, please. Thank you. Just so we don't lose anything along the way. So uh, the Docker chat? No, in the document, the, the Google doc or the <laughs> okay. Zoom chat. Uh, yes, I will be more precise with you. Or chat. Thank you. I'm excited about the, the hope here. I want to see those okay. patches, John. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I hear so, you. Um, the thing is standing that by. If you're using uh, Beehive configuration files, you already have a configuration because the CTL SCSI Roots are part of this configuration. There is no configuration file format. It's only one time state. There is no CTL conf. And I've written my own exec line scripts to figure out the mapping between CTL port to be used by the VIRTIO um, SCSI because it is basically a virtual HBA. And then the exported LUNs are your yeah, SCSI targets. So your config file could look something like this uh, in FreeBSD right now. And the only thing, and the CTL device uh, is passed in from the startup script using the dash O flag. So my run dot. Jan, do you think that's worth documenting in the doc? Do people find this syntax in chat helpful? 
Maybe. Maybe I'll grab if, it. If you want to use it as SCSI, sure. Hmm. And this is how BIF is uh, started. How are you? How is your project coming, Jan? Do you have anything new on GitHub and friends? Uh, which part? <laughs> well, the and ready which part. Project? <laughs> which project? S six managed TTL backed VMs uh, <sighs> with no headaches. Can we have nice things yet is the question. What sort of my theme of the year? Anyway, uh, John, if you have something on the device tree dump in QEMU, so let's take I'm a look. Back. It I'm looks like it's still taking. <laughs> a couple things in. Cool. All right, I have to find the window where I actually had that in edit mode. OK. Um, I have too many windows. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sure you're the only one here with that problem. I'm going to let you edit this, but here it comes. Please. There it is. You should see it. Above yawns or below? Let's. Oh, there we go. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's green. When you invoke when you invoke QEMU, you have a, a QMP option where you specify a, a a device, and then they provide a a shell, for instance, where you specify. That's actually two separate lines. One one is a QEMU option, and the other is a single command you would execute. Oh, this is the QMU shell you're talking about. Yes. So. The 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 QMP the Unix .QMP is an option to the QMP shell command. Where to connect to? Yes. At so, which point you can type in help or do whatever you want, and they have all kinds of good information for debugging. Yeah, it's, it's a if I remember you, correctly, you, it's one line of JSON per message and. Yeah, there are there are multiple layers of this API available. I'm just trying to give you a sample of one of them. Yeah, totally. And debugging is right up John's alley. That he, ah, <laughs> uh, that might inspire him. Yeah, but here's four instances where if you know you can hot plug CPUs, you can hot plug devices and cards and whatever you want. And then you can dump it all back out, which I think is what you were asking. That's about. exactly what I'm asking. Yes. And I don't know how to do that with Beehive at this point in time. Realistically speaking, you, if you have a startup configuration file available, you don't have to because there's nothing you can change. To, I, I agree today. But if we ever get to the point where hot plugging and stuff like that works, yes. then we, we, we need a, a better way. I have... Uh, brought this idea up where what I basically want to have is that Beehive, the runtime process, starts up with no devices and so on, and then the uh, binds the Unix domain socket, locks itself up using Capsicum, and totally isolates itself so that you don't have to jail it anymore. It may even jail itself before entering Capsicum, whatever. Uh, it locks itself up, and then over a Unix domain socket, uh, bound before it locks itself up, you would push in configuration things like this video block device on this PCI device via a Unix socket. And this is, yeah. And that way you could have not just reconfiguration, but proper sandboxing before the configuration is even loaded. And you would have to inject each capability of a Unix socket. For example, if you wanted to uh, attach a ISO image, you would open a file descriptor and send the file descriptor to the image you want to attach instead of the path. At least on a wire level. Of course, you can't reference file descriptors like that on the CLI. 
but nobody volunteered to implement my wish list. Uh, feedback on Jan's idea. <laughs> Did you just flip Beehive on its head in good ways? Well, I think it's a nice idea because honestly, sending a FD to Beehive is great. And you can even set a process descriptor to maybe Beehive such that uh, Beehive can queue other process for you. Maybe it's uh, not so a good idea. Maybe it's a good idea. Why but, would you want uh, to have Beehive manage another process? Uh, just for example, let's say monitoring process, whatever. I run into some weird thing I need to deal with jails. Uh, so I'm just mentioning this is like one really weird use case that, um, okay, I will tell you what's my weird use case. So Please do. this is a bit off topic, uh, go but for it. Uh, you guys familiar with uh, Slurm or some workload management? Uh, nope. This is some so of the like HPC in... rock scheduler, right? Yeah, it's some HPC stuff. So basically, an issue even sometimes in Linux as well, it's not totally a solved problem, is that if you run, say, a container, say a Docker, right? And then what you get in the foreground is not the actual uh, process. The process is still run by the Docker daemon, and then you, you really just get a TTY or not. So when this workload manager, how do they work is that they send a sick term to the foreground mm -hmm. process. That's for there. That's why, like, if you use Slurm to manage this container stuff, uh, you need a proxy. It doesn't actually work if you say over time limit. So they need to secure the process, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So a way you to do that, or at least in my case, is that I create this bi-dimensional uh, bi uh, binding between these two processes, such that when one process queue, the other process die as well. And when the foreground process die, I also queue the um, uh, the background one. And yeah. the beehive solution finished. is more, yeah, the beehive one is, the, the thing I, I talk about is really in the situation that um, when the beehive process ended, you kind of have to queue the foreground thing that's monitoring it. Uh, if the beehive itself is not, uh, hierarchical to the actual process itself because like they can be different jail or whatever. So I was just thinking really weird situations like this because I've encountered them, but not in the context of VM, but in the context of like uh, jails. Mm -hmm. uh, but back to back on topic, I think the main issue is that um, I think Unix domain socket is a good idea, except I think Beehive is having a bit too much state present in the uh, file system namespace. So that actually make uh, sometimes uh, when you try to do some niche things with it, it's a bit difficult. Like say, like if a device node is live in depth, that's always fine because well, it's the device directory um, um, with DevFS. But if you want to have a Unix socket somewhere else, uh, that means wherever you want the Unix socket, it needs to be a rewrite file system. Yes and so no. You can mount, yes, you can mount like time of on No, no, that's not what I'm... It, but, yeah. You can have a Unix socket pair without any writable file system because the sockets are never bound, but start life as a connected pair. You mean just like soft pair or yes, one, socket this pair? Is this is in no way uh, hypervisor related, but yeah, but this is more of for, um, yeah. Unix. But if you have a socket pair, then it doesn't make sense to say you connect back to the beehive. I mean, you can fork it, and then you can have uh, the um, process talk to the parent. I mean, sorry, talk to the child, which the child is the beehive hmm. process. Is that what you mean? No, the problem is that to get the pro the behavior you expect from any network like service, which includes Unix sockets, you need a name to connect to. And the namespace for Unix sockets is the file system. 
So you need yeah. a writable directory to bind a socket into. That's completely correct. And unless we consider the ugly hack, which is the abstract namespace in Linux for Unix sockets, there is no solution around to work around with, except that you can kind of with capsicum and a bit of cleverness, fake your own not quite bind with a socket pair. What you can do is you can have a socket pair where one end using caps write is restricted to only basically pass along this file descriptor used to another process, uh, dupe it or close it, but you can't change its blocking state and so on. Then you can hang this file descriptor around to other processes. And instead of using um, connect and accept, the server will limit the socket buffer space so that only uh, the intended backlog amount of sockets fits into the socket buffer. And then you can always just keep the socket buffer full of new uh, endpoints from a new socket pair. Yeah, but the issue is this That's is a bit too complicated to implement in base Beehive. I'm pretty sure we can do that in some like Beehive hypervisor. It's probably and my response is really, C. yeah, but it's, you know, now we're talking about an other daemon that need to hold a socket pair as well no, as running Beehive. This is only, this would only be used for the earliest startup. If you really needed Beehive, normally you would use a directory and then you can have a file descriptor to the directory and pass that around and use connect. Yeah, 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 but we're referring back to the issue about what if we can have like uh, uh, back to the question of Michael uh, earlier mm -hmm. is that the idea of unit socket and that's a limitation mm -hmm. I see when we try the unit socket approach and that's why it brings up the uh, file system namespace mm -hmm. and what kind of things Beehive is already but taking. The idea here would be to have Beehive, the user space half of a hypervisor, and Beehive the config parser split up into two processes. The config and loading would then just be a, a driver for some library which uses the Beehive process to do the VM exit handling. Okay, but I thought we want something like QMU's shell. I thought in this thing, the context fall of out of that if that you uh, make it possible to configure Beehive to bind a socket somewhere in a directory you tell it. You give it a, you send the configuration loader as one configuration option would just tell Beehive, here is a file descriptor to a directory. F please bind a socket by that name uh, in this directory. Mm -hmm. And that even works within Capsicum and so on because you would inject the capability with do it. And if you use a proper intermediate directory around this, you can isolate it so that nobody else can even enter this directory. You can have a file descriptor to directory, which is world writable, or at least writable to the BF process, yeah. Oh yeah, I completely agree with you, but that's, that's what I mean by there's a lot of directory and there's a lot of states involved. Yes, it is. I'll um, just shoot us your proof of concept when you're ready. <laughs> uh, other thoughts on that entirely unique approach? Would that be massively valuable or kind of nice or uh, just a bunch of work? <laughs> What it would enable is oh, to have well. something like a nomad driver for Beehive, where you declare all everything inside of nomad or some other similar tool, and it would create the Beehive guest without ever serializing it to a config file. And then you could run the Beehive guest as a nomad job or whatever, and have complete integration and proper error handling and so on. John, you had other comments? I, 
it, it would take a long time to get there. I actually do like the idea. It, it has a lot of promise. And is it following not, a different model or is this on your view of the world unique to Beehive? Uh, what do you mean by following a different model? Uh, is like, is KV, Linux KVM doing exactly this? And No, it's not doing exactly this because they're not taking it to this extreme to make it the default interface. Rather, they have a command line interface, as far as I understand, and a shell, and you hope that all the features you use are available via the interface you want to use. Could you map this out on your napkin of choice without having to write a single line of code just to get the idea out there and perhaps in front of, say, John's I eyes? And... Yeah, but... Not sure. Um... I assume, in a long way, I assumed that I just did that, but... You did, uh, yes, but... But um, the problem is that... For those it's present, yes, one of and those it is things recorded. Where if, you, if you have the idea, it's probably obvious, and to anyone else, I could be talking Chinese. Uh, <laughs> that, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> As a resident slow one here, um, I, I would love to see this visually. Know. In some regards, so it's like okay, so this okay, now handles um, this. Here's where it kept. Have you ever up. looked at how Beehive starts up? The first thing it basically does in main is pass its argument vector, right? It takes its command line options. Okay, yeah. One of those options is to basically do the same again for the configuration file. So, and the idea would be instead to break it up and have it. Take it, or maybe just add a new command line option to take the configuration instead of from a file from a Unix socket. And if it's provided as a file descriptor number, basically, by the way, you inherited this uh, connected socket, please use it. That would be the minimal invasive way of doing it. But the interesting part is that. If you use a Unix socket, what uh, is special about Unix socket is that you can send file descriptors and not just normal data over them. So all the things Beehive has to do, which are privileged, like opening a VMM device, opening a tab device, and so on, uh, all of these privileged operations um, could be done in some trusted front end, and then actually, Processing the potentially uh, compromised and malicious input would be done inside the beehive, sandbox beehive process. So the trusted front end would never look at the content the guest provided and would only look at trusted input. And beehive wouldn't have the capability to access the global namespace. So it couldn't uh, be used to, oh, I have a root uh, process. I can have it read uh, the user private key from uh, his home directory or something. Because unless you pass in such a file descriptor for the 9PFS service or something, it just doesn't have a way to even address it because it inside its capsicum uh, sandbox all the time. Capsicum hive. The capsicum is already hive. in the yes. But what it does is it passes the configuration first, opens the, for example, the uh, raw files to be used as block storage itself. And only then, after it has passed its configuration and configured itself using its configuration, only then does it apply the restrictions. With I the idea I'm proposing, one. it can enter the sandbox before loading the configuration because the configuration provided over the socket, for example, as uh, NVPair messages, um, it doesn't just contain the configuration like the MAC addresses, 
or the guest name or whatever, it also contains the file descriptors to the resources to be used. So we wouldn't be telling it where under slash beehive guest uh, main dot img is your raw file image containing your first disk. Instead, you would say here is a disk uh, as file descriptor this. Please make it available using this backend. Yeah, yeah I, I like the idea. Stuff, that... I, um, use avoids this because SCSI is su such a flexible, powerful protocol that you don't have to reconfigure Beehive to reconfigure the SCSI devices because SCSI already has a concept of hot plugging devices and changing devices around. Even resizing devices at runtime is all supported at starting with uh, SPC3. And we're at SPC5 or so in Beehive and CTL. So mm -hmm. all of these features are there as because Beehive speaks generic SCSI. And the only part Beehive does is it emulates a host bus adapter to connect it to the virtual SCSI bus. What's available on the bus is uh, done via uh, CTL, the come target player. And all of this is completely mm -hmm. dynamic. For example, you could even go as far as have uh, iSCSI D connect to uh, an iSCSI target and then have Beehive use it so that you are not even using local storage and it still shows up as just an other SCSI LAN available to your Beehive guest. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael C, you had a comment? For uh, yes, uh, I like the ideas because like, I actually try a patch as well to exactly the same as uh, Michael. You know, I have my uh, my supervisor in one version. I actually modify Beehive as well, and then I take the uh, basically open the FD and send back there. And then other options the available for me to do is basically because that's just an FD, right? So I don't have mm -hmm. to actually have the ISO file host. So mm -hmm. I I agree on all of that, but I'm not quite sure about the security benefit side of it because the security benefit is that beehive especially without capsicum if you disable it for, uh, for example to make use of the restore patch which disable it for mm -hmm. a while then beehive is running as an unrestricted process maintaining a root and not dropping privileges so the I only understand. thing standing uh, between you and a local root exploit is Beehive in that case. So yeah, any bug uh, um, in Beehive which is exploitable would get, if you get code execution from the guest into the hypervisor the process, you root on the host immediately without Capsicum. With yeah, Capsicum, uh, uh, it's a bit more restrictive, but it's still all static. Okay, yeah, that might be more clear. <laughs> Clear. I, I mean, in terms of like input sanitization, mm -hmm. because if you have, I don't think it provides much more security in terms of like um, input sanitization. Because if you have the um, the parser, mm -hmm. the, the parser, the configuration parser still have to open the file. So if the bug is in the parser, parsing the algorithm itself, it will still open. Of course. A file if it's not supposed to open and send the FD over. The security benefit I mean. is, is that um, the attack surface, for example, let's say um, you run one thing that becomes relevant <coughs> would be the 9P server. Mm -hmm. And let's say I want to add a shared directory, so a 9P server at runtime, which right now isn't possible. But uh, mm -hmm. with the structure in Beehive doesn't really prevent you from do adding this. I've so as soon as you can hot plug PCI devices at all, you can basically hot plug them all, and then you need a socket to pass it in. And if you pass it in as paths, you can no longer use a capsicum, and you have to disable all sandboxing. 
So you have to use Unix domain sockets and file descriptor parsing if you want to support any runtime reconfiguration uh, of the hypervisor, not the buses as it, it is attached to um, at all. And if you do that, why use this, not use it for everything? Because you already had to implement it. Why keep yeah. oh. integration oh. mechanisms? I'm mostly thinking because Dave has a talk in your BSD call about basically read only images for FreeBSD because one mm -hmm. of the really used uh, situation is that uh, to basically have a read only FreeBSD appliance and then just have minimal uh, write writable part and then just run it. So That's I think my only concern possible in about is a more, dozen different ways. I know, I know. Uh, hear me out. Uh, that's why I'm thinking in terms of like, if there are better ways we can do that with less states in the file system namespace as possible. Mm -hmm. That um, is like my concern because like if I have a totally something I expect to be totally re like mostly read only, I know usually VAR is, you know, we always mm -hmm. mount something on VAR anyway. Exactly. But, also uh, camp. Yeah, yeah. So I just think if there's a better way or more generic, go through it. Like if um, we can have something in the device level or something, because if each VM does create their own dev VMM device. Yeah. Like if we have a device node, is it possible uh, we can reuse it somehow? Um, I would argue against that because you're basically re-implementing Unix socket over IO control. <laughs> It would be yeah. a, a really ugly, ugly clutch, and there isn't any requirement to do it because you always have, at least in a realistic Beehive host system, you will always have a writable file system, even if it's only tempfs. And tempfs is fine for that because mm -hmm. the socket by design can't outlive the kernel. So there's no reason to persist the socket to persistent file system. And while under-documented and uh, probably unknown to most users, there is support for ha um, having slash var as a, uh, at least var db and so on, be created mm -hmm. from the rc.d scripts into a tempfs from the m tree. So the M3 created you an installation telling the system what should be there, all of the directories you're normally missing when you mount an empty uh, tempfs slash var can be created by enabling the right rc.conf entries. Those are documented in the main page. It's just that probably nobody bothered to look them up <laughs> um, because mm -hmm. I'm re-implemented all of this uh, only to find out that it was already there. <laughs> In which manual page? rc.conf. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's all documented. You only have to know to look. Uh, and read the uh, source, Luke. <laughs> exactly. But it's one of the cases where it's easy once you know how to ask, uh, know the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forming the right question is the hard part. Um. And with that, having any tempfs mounted is good enough to have Unix sockets. And then mm. you would just use those. Uh, the logical place to keep it would be under var run something mm -hmm. because it's expected to be there for sockets and uh, pit files. But coming back to the request for pit files, so the problem with just doing a cheap dummy pit file implementation is that uh, you probably want to use uh, the pit file support fun functions from libutil to do proper locking. Uh, the out of tree workaround to get this would be to have a chain loader, which creates a pit file and then XX into uh, to um, Beehive intentionally leaking the pit file descriptor, which is already locked, uh, because then as soon as Beehive the process dies, uh, 
automatically the kernel will uh, unlock the file and the pit file is marked as stale according to the libutil pit file functions. So basically when it tries to judge if the pit file is stale, it does a non-blocking locking attempt on the pit file. And if it succeeded, it knows that the original process, which was supposed to hold the lock must have died. So the pit file must be stale. Um, yes, so. Uh, Michael, I'm gonna have to leave. I actually have a, a work meeting coming up. Um, I have a suggestion, I do, and I can try to provide a little bit of information. Sure. If we were to meet next week, maybe um, getting a, a QEMU command line and looking at how they pass sockets around, which is very similar to what he's referring to, um, might be might be eye-opening. I, I don't know, but it's something we could discuss. Okay, I will be camping next week, and that might be a time to skip. Um, I could try to drop in, but I will not be very effective. So maybe no, do, do your we homework do on collecting that. Um, you, and see. So it's handling them by default or optionally? They are options that you pass. Okay. It's, a, it's a way of doing things. And you said it, how it's handling sockets, QEMU. Well, no, it's how it passes file descriptors around. Okay. Got it. thank you. Uh, how it it does, doesn't it just it does uh, things similar to what you... don't we just reference them as numbers from JSON messages and send I'm... the message in the same uh, send MSG uh, call as uh, the so the JSON object and the file descriptors referenced by it. Yeah, yes, but at the level there's you're looking at it, yeah. way to do it. Sorry about that. John, you got to go, Ray. Well, thank you. You've certainly inspired some great conversations. And we all look forward to those patches, especially if it's as simple as maybe we could have a flag that says show the <laughs> entire fine. Beehive command rather than just Beehive VM name, which is um, great for a new user and agony one for of the more things advanced which users. Go ahead, John. Probably easy to add if right. is have the parser uh stay because the option to dump the past configuration is already there yeah uh, and what we could probably quite easily yep. add is a handler for a signal like a usr1 or 2 uh, or info uh, to um dump the configuration to standard error without exiting oh hello okay i'm listening that would be probably quite simple to add to Beehive and it would just use the existing emitter code to emit the, the used configuration because the, the way it's implemented in uh, Beehive, if I understand correctly, is that the command line options are basically translated into uh, config lines and then passed. So uh, that you end up with the, the one true configuration file in the end. Under Beehive as we know it in its current uh, state? Under Beehive as we know it today in FreeBSD 13 and 14. Okay. Uh, it would dump the config or the full command that launched it or both? No, it would what? dump a, a config equivalent to what's passed up to that time. And if you do it at one time, the a configuration equivalent to what's running and you could just, if you want to restart it with this option, you could just put this configuration in. And it's probably everything expanded and so on. So you may not want to do it, but it's perfectly usable to understand how this uh, behalf process you don't know about uh, was configured. Of course, it's a breakdown of your operations if you have such processes regularly and you should do something about that, but that's uh, not helpful to any production user. Basically, you shouldn't have made this mistake. So uh, 
So you could hypothetically do a control T on a process that's eaten up. That console would be and just get exactly, your and it would just dump the configuration out. I'm not certain that control T would be nice to use for it. On one way, it would be perfect. In another, I'm sure there's circumstances be, where it would be very useful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but having a long multi line message with control T is mm, unusual. I said debugging, but ship it. Yeah. Great. I look forward to it. I'll test it for you. Thanks. Mm. Ah, good stuff, people. Very good. Mm. Uh, we are past a moose jaw oh. worth of travel time from <laughs> Portland outward. Uh, anything else or any last thoughts that popped in your heads relating regarding to pit files i can show what i did to get around the need for pit files which is what i consider basically mandatory to do the reboot and shutdown and halting uh sure and john you've hopefully heard that and just check the minutes if there's some code appearing shortly how yon avoided the need for pit files i run it under a six rc Oh, well, okay. Uh, or run it or some other process supervisor. And the process supervisor uh, will run a finish handler and pass the exit code to the finish handler as argument. So for example, let me grab it from my unfinished Ansible thing I've been teasing you with for far too long. <laughs> <sighs> I just need a minute to find the right file. Of course. Take care, John. Thank you for all your great input. Okay. Um, oh, um, okay. Dip, 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 dip. I am um, uh, the my Ansible playbook is suffering from terminal uh, YAML and Ginger. Okay. But let's just look at the result, maybe. Uh, I will try to uh, hijack the screen sharing. Uh, sure, let me stop and that might help. Are you seeing a large terminal with lots of... Uh... Yes, and a four point font. Okay, let me change the font size for you. I think I'm gonna have to step out too before I start okay. gnawing on my arm or something. For lunch, <laughs> yeah. Uh, nudge me on the Windows VM goodies and I'll try to get you some AMD GPU information. Yeah. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Oh, so, yeah, uh, okay. So many topics, so many topics. Anyway, thank you. bye. take care, bye. So this is the relevant exec line code. It's, think of it as a le easier to template alternative to shell. Mm. Uh, what it does is it figures out the name of the guest so that I can have the same script for for all my Beehive guests. And it will decode from its uh, um, location which guest was to lock. So, okay. And then it just tests the first argument. And if the first argument is zero, okay the guest wanted to be rebooted. So it destroys, at this time, the Beehive process is already dead and it just cleans up the VM so that the new Beehive process, which will be created, doesn't reuse a dirty VMM device. Then, okay, 
if it's one, the guest wanted to shut down and not be rebooted. In this case, I configure the current S6 RC service with dash uppercase O, which just says make this uh, execute once service, which means it will not be restarted. So the service disables itself. Here, okay, uh, the guest wanted to be halted. So don't restart, but also don't clean up the VMM device so that you can still access the guest memory content. And if it's uh, free, then okay, it crashed with a triple fault, uh, destroy the state and let it reboot. And if anything else happened, just uh, Beehive violated the expected protocol and reboot it. Are you willing to paste that into the doc? Sure. Cool, danke. It would be easy to translate this to a shell script and or basically run Beehive and then dispatch on dollar question mark in a case statement. Uh, yes, sir. I love this it. It's just the if else chain yep. equivalent to a. Do, 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 do. So this is uh, would be the shell equivalent. Structure, not the whole. Oh, so which syntax is the is that first one? Uh, exec line. It's a port I maintain. Ah, okay. It's a scripting language implemented by rewriting the argument vector and exacting. And it's meant for a, a very short scripts to during startup where you basically want to set up the process state in exec into your daemon. Uh, okay. Something like is, apply resource limits and exec. Are you familiar with sub, uh, shell scripts which end in an exec line? Basically, apply resource limits, change your effective user ID and so on. And it's for this kind of thing. Maintainer crest. Alrighty yes. then, I see it. <laughs> it's, uh, and one of its advantages compared to POSIX shell is that it has same quoting and chomping and splitting and so on rules that you don't have to add, make your script twice as long so that it is not unreliable, exploitable, slash buggy. Okay. Because in Shell, it's so easy to write something down and then you do the error handling and the quoting and the triple quoting and- Yeah, <laughs> guilty as charged. You have to do it like that in POSIX Shell, but yeah. in exact line, the syntax is a bit simpler. Uh, argument, so verbal expansion and so on is more explicit and it's fine for these short scripts. You shouldn't use it for a thousand line program, but 10 lines or something like this or something which should be 10 lines is no problem. Okay. Anything else? And so who's left? Michael, you're brave. Michael Great. Is here. Good work. Just for, I'm left alone with Michael. Yes, well, we have Jan and John, and Michael goes by Jan. <laughs> Andrew is the only one who's not having collisions. <laughs> okay, yeah, no. Well, uh, we covered some amazing ground there. Thank you. With actionable snippets for people. Yeah, and the run, let me find out if I can fit, fit this into a single message. I know it's too long. I have to break it up. Okay, fine. And you can plop it right in the doc if you like, that'll handle longer. Because uh, I'm just copy and pasting also. Okay, adjust the separator and then do. 
this is my startup script. It's one script and two messages. Mm -hmm. There we go. Goodness. Okay. What is uh, basically it recovers the worldwide uh, uh, whatever the unique identifier. Okay. A worldwide port number. WWPN. It's a unique identifier for a SCSI uh, port. And it's a 64 bit number. And there is a standardized schema for embedding um, MAC addresses. So a 48 bit identifier into their 64 bit identifier namespace. And I actually made sure to look it up so that I basically identify the VITIO SCSI port on the Beehive guest by its first MAC address. So that I avoid uh, port identifier collisions on the SCSI bus, which is something you're not supposed to have. And it allows me to dynamically allocate the um, the come target, come target layer device so that I don't have to hard code any indices in there because you really have to dynamically allocate them for what I'm doing. Fantastic. Uh, I have some other uh, stuff here to drip. But well, uh, I used it uh, yesterday in my Ansible stuff with um, um, Antrinik after you left. Mm -hmm. And we did basically add this here. And this is all that was required to create a new Ansible. Uh, a new uh, Beehive guest in Ansible with it and spin it up. Noted. But... Okay. Well, we're at two hours. Maybe we should call it there. Yes. And uh, I am away well, next a long week. Day. Hmm? What's that? Oh, nothing. I was going to say it's a long one. Oh, hey, they've gotten longer. One. <laughs> One jail call uh, reached four hours, three of which were recorded. Have, um, started without you. Yeah, as long as you record it and keep minutes, hey, go for it. I mean, I, I don't want to be a blocking point of single point of failure mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. Anyway, well, I'm calling well, it officially at home. Go ahead, Michael. Well, I'm out next week as well. So cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Michael. Yes. Uh, I did use config in it to upgrade the Beehive guest from 13.1 to 2.2, and it just worked as expected. So config in it is a possible way to go. OK, remind our audience, uh, was that over a serial interface? No, not yet. I just okay. used it uh, from a file, but a tar file is a tar file is a tar uh, file. Yeah. And by the way, I just remembered that FreeBSD tar being implemented as a wrapper around libarchive will eat any archive format it understands, including ISO files. Yeah, okay, interesting. Yes. So you could already drop an ISO on, uh, on a read-only block device mm -hmm. and have config in it consume it because, oh, it's an ISO. I know that. Yep. <laughs> I know ISO. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, of all these cool topics, please keep track of them somehow and just reveal your news as it arrives. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Talk to you in uh, perhaps a week for the jail call and perhaps two weeks for more. Enjoy your vacation. Thank you. Take I'll be week camping. Off. Okay, everyone, take care. I will stop recording. Leave the laptop at home. <laughs> ah, I wish. <laughs> take care. <laughs>